now. Um, so welcome to the latest edition in the bi Biological Physics and Physical Biology uh, seminar series that has been life-sustaining for many people in our community throughout this long, long pandemic. Um, and as also as the pandemic maybe ends, um, is also a way to keep you know bringing people together um, from widely disparate parts of um, the globe. So uh, we have two really exciting speakers today, and it's a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Will Ratcliffe from Georgia Tech, who will be telling us about how to get cool things for free, or as this title says, how physics scaffolds the origin of multicellularity. Um, so Will, take it away. Thanks. Uh, yeah, you'll notice that I just seem to pull titles randomly from different places. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've hit that stage of being a professor. I have a, a database of titles in my brain. They don't always match up. It's great to see everybody here. Thanks for having me. And it's cool to see some friendly faces uh, in the in the in the audience. Heidi, uh, Ned, wonderful to see you. I wish we could say hi in person. In any case, let's get going. So um, it's great to be here. I am primarily an evolutionary biologist, but I realized maybe six or seven years ago that I couldn't understand the questions that I'm interested in evolutionary biology without understanding essentially the physical processes which underpin them. And so it's been very fun to take the sort of, make an intellectual sandwich with cell biology, really small scale stuff. And sort of one side, uh, evolution is sort of the main central framework in which everything is, is, is processed. And then macro scale physics being the other essentially requisite piece of, of, of methods and inquiry and, 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 and approaches that are required to understand how multicellular organisms evolve. So I'm going to try to do this in 25 minutes and we'll probably fail, but that'll be fun too. Uh, feel free to, I'm not sure what the best way to do questions is, honestly. Um, Sonia, what do people yeah. typically ask in progress um, or at the end? Yeah, I, I was actually just putting something in the chat to say that. So we, what we usually do is people have questions, um, mm -hmm. they'll put it in the chat, and if there's something that's really urgent to clarify, mm -hmm. we can interrupt mm -hmm. you. Sure. If not, we can leave the questions for um, the end, either you know the five minutes after your talk or okay. a little period after both talks. Um, and we can also email you all the questions later if, if you want to follow up with anybody. Sounds awesome. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thanks. Okay, so I think most people in this in this audience are aware that multicellularity has evolved repeatedly on Earth. In fact, everything you see here is an independently evolved multicellular lineage from a different unicellular ancestor. Over the last 10 years, I think our field has sort of coalesced around this idea that a generative way of thinking about how multicellularity is constructed. Karina Tarnita has, has played a leading role in developing this construction-based approach is through life cycles. And that a life cycle is sort of a diagram which depicts how cells divide, grow, how the lineage reproduces. And it's not just a fact of the matter. I think you, you can as a sort of factually describe any multicellular organism making another one as a life cycle, but it also is critically important because the life cycle encodes key pieces of information about how this system can evolve, right? It sort of dictates the scale of genetic variation that exists within the group. It plays important roles of understanding how multicellular groups gain the ability to uh, become Darwinian entities with heritable variation, which natural selection can act on, which then drives the subsequent evolution of the system by imbuing information and encoding novel multicellular traits. So um, we're interested in the evolution of multicellularity, and we're taking this sort of life cycles construction first approach. Um, and our approach has been to evolve it from scratch. Our, our primary model system is, uh, is Baker's yeast, which is a single celled fungus. And we do the simplest experiment in the world. Um, this is sort of following off of Rich Lenski's long-term evolution experiment, where he's literally doing the simplest experiment in the world, where you just take E. coli and you passage some every day to fresh media and they grow exponentially, in his case, for 75,000 generations. Here, we're doing kind of the same thing, but there's a step where we used settling selection to select for groups of cells. So we grow our yeast exponentially for 24 hours, and then we take a subsample out of that bigger population, put them on the bench, let them sit. Bigger groups sink faster than smaller groups, so we can screen for size. Size is an important trait in multicellularity. It's something which is under selection for many different reasons in virtually every lineage which becomes multicellular. 
We then take those surviving big groups, passage them back to fresh media, and rinse and repeat. From that, we get with these things we call snowflake yeast. So they they have this cool sort of fractal-like branching morphology. Um, this is typically the end of my talk, but I decided to stick it in the very beginning of this talk for this audience because this is sort of our roadmap in a sense. And if we have this sort of life cycles perspective of thinking, how does a dumb clump of cells evolve to become something which is we call a multicellular organism, right? Um, you need groups of cells to become Darwinian entities such that they are capable of reproduction. They, they vary from one another in their multicellular traits. That variation affects fitness. Natural selection acts on those multicellular traits, and you see this selection driving innovation. So in our system, our snowflake yeast are a single mutation away from the, from the unicellular ancestor. You have a, a mutation which disrupts daughter cell separation, and you get mother-daughter cells just being physically attached with permanent bonds. And the cool thing there is that as your group grows, you get essentially a jamming transition. Um, you run, it becomes very rigid. Then if you try and shove another cell into that group, it fractures a branch. And much like cutting a branch off a tree, if you break any cell-cell connection, you've broken that cell away from the rest of the group. And you have this now branch that separates. It's no longer densely packed. It grows up to its parent size before it starts to reproduce. Now, once you have this basic developmental plan of, of daughter cells simply remaining attached to their mother cells, now, if you change the phenotype of those cells, so we don't have classic developmental biology here. We don't have genetically, genetically encoded development where essentially there is a, there's genetic information which is translated into a multicellular morphology, the way that it would be for animals and plants and stuff like that. That's kind of gold standard development. We don't have that. We have dumb clumps of cells. However, if you have mutations which only actually directly affect the properties of cells, like in this case, making the cells more elongate, there are emergent multicellular properties that arise from that. So if you make the cells longer, it changes the way they pack, and you get bigger groups. And it turns out that group size is very heritable, and selection can act upon it. And what we find is that over time, we are seeing the gradual progression of multicellular adaptation. We're seeing our snowflake yeast, we call it, yeah, evolve to become macroscopic. They're getting 20,000 times larger than their ancestor. And even more than that, we think they're evolving simple develop uh, cellular differentiation. I'm going to try and tell you about all of this in the next like 17 minutes, which seems impossible. But um, this is just to sort of re-go re over the fact that they have this cool fractal morphology. Um, if you grow them from a single cell, you have synchronized uh, cellular, cellular budding, which is actually just kind of pretty to see. And that this does result in a life cycle where you, you get jamming resulting in fracture. Life cycles are critical because if you don't have groups that can create new groups, then it's not a system which is which has the potential to be Darwinian. You need that exponential growth as a driver for you know a struggle for existence. Um, and you know if you simply don't have the ability for groups to create new groups, then you're at a, you're at a dead end from the very beginning. So we've done this experiment many different ways over over years, and we always see the same thing happening. Our yeast evolves to get larger. And they do this through two primary routes of adaptation. The first thing they do is they make their cells more elongate. This is actually a fairly old paper where we were just examining the first couple weeks of evolution. Um, I'll show you what happens when you, when you let it run longer than that. But you can see that even when you have slightly more elongate cells like you have over here, this is just us uh, playing with an atomic force microscope and crushing clusters and looking at the amount of energy we have to input before they fracture. The rounder cell ones are pretty brittle as they get a little bigger, they really lose the ability to absorb energy before breaking. And then this would be their spontaneous size of fracture. Whereas the more elongate cell ones, you can see they actually have a much shallower slope here. They're more resilient material. And they, they really take this lever and push it really far. The second thing a snowflake yeast might do is make its connection to its daughter cell stronger. If they have round cells. So, so up here, we just did it. We made a 3D simulation of snowflake yeast. And, the top ones here have twice the connection strength of the bottom ones. And so if, if they're round celled, oh, I'm sorry, I'm using my mouse on the wrong monitor. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I was trying to point to things and you couldn't see it. Uh, let me just go to a laser pointer here. If they're round celled, then it doesn't really matter if they make stronger connections, they just blow right through the higher ceiling. But if they have elongate cells, now these things interact, right? There's a an epistatic interaction, if you will, between cell shape and the strength of cell cell connections, at least in theory. One of the nice things about yeast, though, is we can actually test these things experimentally. So uh, a postdoc in my lab, Tony, 
did this cool, simple synthetic biology experiment. Here's a, a nascent snowflake. It's just one mutation away from a single-celled ancestor. Delete the gene ACE2. Then if we make, if we delete a cell, which is a kinase that lives in the bud scar, in the, in the connection between two cells, this actually results in a much larger bud opening and, and, and more connective and more chitinous material connecting cells. You get bigger groups. We can make the cells really long by messing with the cell cycle gene, CLIB2, which results in this noisy, big groups, but lots of noise. And if you combine the two, cell length with bud scar strength, you get these beautiful, very large groups. We can actually quantify the amount of interaction here at and above you would expect from the, the main effects of each mutation, and it's big. So we're actually, we can kind of recapitulate these combinations of traits, lengthening cells and strengthening connections that we see happening in our experiment. This is all to say, this is sort of assuming that we, that we have a mechanism of heredity. Like what underpins the ability for snowflake yeast to undergo sustained Darwinian adaptation? Not just one or two mutations, but something where over thousands of generations, they evolved to get bigger and bigger and bigger and potentially more complex. This has long been considered a stumbling block in our field because people have assumed that you need another level of regulation, like a level of multicellular development, which sort of plays that role of coordinating morphogenesis. And we're strictly in a regime of, of emergent biophysical properties, we think. Um, well, it turns out, honestly, to our surprise, that the emergent multicellular traits that arise from these changes in cell level properties are, are very heritable. In fact, we can, we can quantify this. I don't want to go on a long tangent about heritability, but I'll just define this because I know there's a lot of quantitative folks in the audience. There's a lot, several different ways biologists quantify heritability. In this case, what we're looking at is we're using a variance partitioning approach, which asks in a population composed of multiple genotypes, what proportion of the variation in their phenotypes is encoded, it can be ascribed to genes. Very, very simple method. It's called broad sense heritability. So we can make different mutations in cell cycle genes, which give you different average aspect ratios of cells. And then we could pool these different strains into a, into a population and ask, what is the heritability? Or we could, we could simulate different populations composed of these genotypes and ask, what's the heritability of cell aspect ratio? We can then ask these same mutations, cell aspect ratio, change the size to which groups can grow. Longer cells result in less packing uh, intensity before the clusters. Basically, with cells that are longer, there's more free space around cells, uh, around cells in groups. So they get bigger before they jam and they fracture. And so we have this emergent multicellular trait arising from changes from mutations which affect aspect ratio. And that's the size to which groups grow before they fracture. Um, we can actually then do the exact same thing. What's the heritability of these multi of this multicellular trait? And in pretty much all, all of our different um, comparisons here, this multicellular trait is more heritable than the cell level trait itself, which is kind of cool because typically group selection models assume that groups are not very heritable and that selection on groups isn't very efficacious. But here we have clonal groups and, and there's actually a sort of hidden benefit here that clonal groups, when you have a lot of cells in that group, if the expression level of a trait at the cell level is somewhat noisy, well then if you're selecting on an emergent property of that as a group as a whole, you can actually average over some of that non-heritable noise in the cell's gene expression. And the group's expression now is a close, has more fidelity, has a better signal to noise ratio, and that, that effectively increases the heritability of that trait. So group formation doesn't necessarily mean that group level traits, which aren't encoded for by modern developmental mechanisms, aren't heritable. In fact, it's, that's not a problem at all. They're emergently heritable. And uh, we have a paper on this, as well as a second paper, which connects this to uh, the physics of entropy. I would love to describe this, but I'm but Peter Juncker, my, my soft matter uh, biophysics collaborator at Georgia Tech, is coming next week. And this is work that's really led by him and, and his fantastic graduate student that I co-advised, Tom Day. So I'll let him talk about this, but there's some really interesting connections between um, between heritability, which is typically what I think about, and um, the emergent biophysical properties of cells in organisms, given that they have to ex uh, occupy three-dimensional space and certain conformations of cell of cells are much more likely to occur than others. And that imbues a certain predictability to the macro state of a multicellular organism, which imbues a certain heritability to those multicellular, those simple multicellular organisms as well. I feel like I'm going fast, but I, I don't really have a great sense of my timing here. So 
I'm sorry if I'm going too fast, but, but I want to get to the cool stuff, which I'm getting to right now. We're doing a long-term, like, you know, Rich Lenski style, 30-year selection experiment in my lab. And we're about four or five years into this. We've reached about 1,200, 1,300 daily transfers on our snowflake yeast. And up to the first 600 transfers, uh, paper is in uh, review right now, revision. Uh, it's taking a long time to do all the things the referees want. Um, and we see macroscopic multicellularity evolving from microscopic ancestors. Uh, this is a big collaboration. Um, and uh, so this is, this is a, a plot that sort of actually underplays the changes in size through time. One thing you'll notice is that all of our different five replicate populations are evolving larger size in kind of synchrony for the first 150 days. Then two of them really peel off, while as the others take a while longer to catch back up. These ones up here are about 20,000 times bigger than the ancestor because this is a log scaled y-axis and it's radius. So it's really, really logged <laughs> to all hell. Um, but these things are, are, are massively bigger. Uh, you, can, you can just see the difference here, the ancestors on the left and our macroscopic snowflake easter on the right. They're still clonal. Uh, they're still growing with a very similar basic mechanism and they're very densely packed as you can see from this volumetric electron microscopy. So I mentioned before that aspect ratio is one of the main levers they pull on to get big. And you can kind of see that here over the first, uh, you know, up, up to aspect ratio 2.3 or so, you know, they start out at 1.1. There's a pretty nice linear relationship between aspect ratio and radius. And then you have this really, you know, nonlinear <laughs> transition here. We're getting a little longer. It gives you huge groups. And we actually can look at the effects of aspect ratio on packing fraction or the proportion of the volume of the cluster that's biomass, uh, you know, cellular biomass. We expect, uh, this is again based on a, this is a nice, just simple simulation of snowflake yeast growth that if you, growth, that if you have longer cells, you get fluffier clusters that are less densely packed. And initially our snowflake yeast that are evolving actually fall right along these expectations. This is nice because we didn't fit the model, uh, but it conforms well to the, bio the biology of our system. But then around aspect ratio 2.3, you see this again peel off. And now with longer cells, rather than becoming less dense, they're becoming more dense. Something has changed, something's happening. What's happening is that our yeast are evolving long enough cells that our cells are not trees anymore, where if you cut off where the, where the, where the branches are not wrapped around each other, these cells are becoming entangled, much like vines. Um, we did a lot of work to show entanglement. We looked at strain stiffening. We looked at percolation and in volumetric EM. Believe me when I say these things are entangled. The largest connected component of these large, gr large groups is almost all the cells in these large groups. And they are about, you know, snowflake yeast start out 100 times weaker than gelatin as a material, but they evolve to be as strong and tough as wood uh, once they evolve these entangled components. And, that, and, and this really, you know, entanglement is the mechanism through which this is occurring because there's, there's really no other way other than making these things sticky, which they're not doing, to have such a large increase in material and sort of material toughness. In order to break these things, you're not breaking one bond anymore, you're breaking thousands of bonds. And entanglement provides a mechanism that affords that increased multicellular strength. I want to touch briefly uh, on, on the emergence of differentiation, um, both because it's cool and it's new work. This is not published. Take it all with a big grain of salt. We could be wrong. It's not even on the bioarchive. Um, and I think this connects to our next speaker as well. Um, Ashok is, is I'm, I haven't seen his talk yet, but I'm really curious. And it's, it's in the connection between cell shape and cell behavior. And I think there's similar things happening in our, in our system. So um, this is also work that's led by a grad student in my lab, Kai Tong, in collaboration with Yuha, um, who he spent some time with when he was locked out of the country due to COVID. He went home to China right before COVID and was, didn't come home for two years and uh, completely upset his whole PhD. He was working on something different, but he's done cool stuff, so I think it has worked out. So he did single cell RNA-seq on snowflake yeast from the ancestor all the way up to 1,000 transfers, which is, for perspective, about 5,000 generations. And you know these things make the macroscopic transition in this lineage by about T600. Um, if you're used to looking at single cell RNA-seq plots, this is standard stuff. This is a UMAP condensation of high dimensional trait space into what's basically a fancy principal component analysis. Each dot is a single cell. I should say that we actually ran six biological replicates per strain here. We have five strains times zero through time 1000, six strains times zero through time 1000 with six biological reps per strain. And um, each dot is a single cell. 
So the ancestor basically has kind of one, you know, cloud here. By 200 transfers, we have the second group of cells popping up, which persists to time 400. By time 600, uh, this is somewhat different, right? You can see this all over here. This little this little secondary group is still here, but now you have um, a big group. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the main groups just moved down. Uh, by 800, you have a third group. And um, by 1,000, you have a third group as well. I'm going to explain these groupings differently. This is just to show uh, our biological replicates and um, yeast are neat because we can actually barcode them and then pool the biological replicates. They were grown separately, barcoded, grown separately, and then all pooled together for sequencing. So we don't have to spend like $60,000 through the sequencing, but we can still have replication, which is nice because you can control for uh, you know batch effects that way. And our, our biological reps look really clean. So we think these reps are really, these differences are really due to endogenous differences. There's a lot of ways to parse single cell RNA seq <laughs> data sets and, and define what a cell type is. Um, as with any classification problem in biology, it's, it's fundamentally philosophical. Um, we chose uh, to basically partition into three different groups, a major group, a minor group, and a stressed cell group. Uh, major and minor have to do with just sort of the number of cells in those groups, and the stressed cells really are stressed and, and like basically dying. Um, this is not a plot you're, you're, you're supposed to be able to read. Um, what we're looking at are these three different, sorry about that. I, I don't know what to do with, with so much data and how to condense it down to something that's visible, but I'll just try and guide you through the forest here. We have our three different major, uh, three different cell types, the major cell type, the minor cell type, and the stress cell type, putative cell types. Um, and this is over here on the top of each one is an axis looking at it through time, right? It's looking at how these, at the, at how different biological processes are changing over evolutionary time within each cell type. So the major cell type guys, they're all, it doesn't matter what, what time point in evolution you're looking at, they're all expressing ribosomal biosynthesis. These are just rapidly growing yeast cells. That's normal yeast. This is what we expect to see. Our minor cell type is doing something really interesting. They are, as of as soon as the minor cell type really pops up as a big feature in T200, they are making lots of cell wall biosynthetic genes. The main one that they're upregulating is glucan biosynthesis, which are components of the cell wall, which of course is inter interesting to us because these yeast are under so much biophysical selection to become tough. So making more cell wall material is kind of interesting. It makes sense. And it's interesting that it, uh, it's not expressed in every cell, but just a subset. And then in our stress response, our stress cells, one of the main things that we're seeing is there's, there's a stress response in the ancestor. We think that's they're, they're forming groups for the first time. They, don't, they didn't kind of have any experience with that. There's no stress, stress cells at all in T200 and 400. And then by 600 to 1,000, once they're macroscopic, we're seeing a lot of program cell death. Uh, and, the, and the mechanisms there is interesting, but I don't have time to go into it. All right, I'm near the end of my talk here. I'm not exactly sure what my timing is, but I'm going to wrap up now. Um, putative functions, these are, these are pure hypotheses. So again, take it as a hypothesis. <laughs> uh, what we think the minor cell type is doing is we think these cells may be specializing for biophysical strength of the cluster. Recall that we have this branched material, right? Our snowflake yeast clusters have old cells that have a bunch of branches coming off them and new cells that have very few. So if you're going to you know, work across a strength uh, growth rate trade-off, the best place to invest in strength without impairing growth that much is to really strengthen those older hub cells. And in fact, if we stain with glucan, aniline blue, a glucan stain, we see that it's preferentially staining these older cells where there's lots of connections and where our modeling and experiments suggest that a lot of our fracture is occurring. So this may be a simple way of, of strengthening the clusters by strengthening these cells that have a big load on them. And this might be a cool sort of intrinsic genotype by environment interaction where these cells are under biophysical stress. Any response to that might be make more cell wall and they may just be ramping up a pre-existing behavior that existed in the ancestor, which we actually think a lot of multicellular development is doing things like that, taking behaviors and repurposing them. In terms of stress cells, um, this requires a little more explanation, but we see stress cells, which we know are resulting in death, rising to like 25% of our cell population by, by T800, which is a lot of cells to die. Uh, and we actually think this may have an adaptive purpose, um, and I'll explain. Up until T, up until entanglement, so T200 through 400, our yeast have this intrinsic reproductive life cycle where they grow, they, they jam, they fracture, and they break branches. And those branches go off and become new snowflakes. 
it's critical that they reproduce in our system because every day we do our selection experiment takes a subsample of the whole population. The whole population is 10 mils of media. We pull out one mil to do settling selection. So if a group just survives and has perfect survival during settling selection, but it doesn't reproduce, it's at, it's at an evolutionary dead end. It has a 90% chance of not even getting a chance to compete for settling selection. So that group, that strategy gets washed out. It, you have to reproduce in our system or you die or your lineage dies, even worse. And so intrinsically, they have a reproduction type of reproduction, which is caused by cellular packing. But once they evolve entanglement, which makes them very, very tough and form big groups, they actually destroy their pre-existing mechanism of reproduction. Now they form these entangled clusters, which don't break apart very easily. So they do some fragmentation, but not very much. So we actually think that this program cell death may be a way of, of creating a new life cycle and refining the life cycle that they have. Because if they have like 25% of their cells die, that doesn't create cause the big groups to break apart because those, those branches are still highly entangled. But the peripheries of the clusters, which are not entangled, you start to shed propagules. And in fact, that's what you see here in these size distributions. T600 is entangled, but doesn't have super high rates of program cell death. T800 and 1000 have, have been entangled now for thousands of generations, and they're throwing off all these tiny propagules, which weren't there in the first entangled genotypes. So those are our hypotheses for simple cell differentiation arising in our system. I'm going to wrap here um, because I think I might be over time, but just I'll close with the thought that when I started my experiments, I thought snowflake yeast were very interesting but weird organisms that don't necessarily that similar to the types of multicellular that have evolved in nature. But actually, the longer I've been thinking about this, the more I think that they capture some of the key characteristics of extant lineages, namely this simple mechanism of growing, forming clonal groups by having daughter cells remain attached to their mother cells. We know that's old. We know that goes back to basically the origin of cells. We have fossils of cells of bacteria forming filaments, right? Three and a half billion years ago. So that part's easy. And it turns out that the types of, multi of lineages that have evolved to become complex, uh, except for animals, plants, brown algae, red algae, and fungi, four out of five. And animals, we just don't know what the ancestors looked like, also had this type of sort of tree-like multicellular ancestors, where many of the sort of physical scaffolds for having a life cycle, having heritability, allowing the system to become Darwinized at the multicellular level, very plausibly could have been playing a role in their origin and sort of emergence as, you know, robust Darwinian lineages. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank uh, my lab, people who've done, you know, all the work, and I get to take credit for it, our funders, our collaborators, and uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but thank you for, for being here. Let's, let's thank the speaker for a really, really fascinating talk. Um, it's really, as always, every, you know, everything that your lab is working on is just, just fascinating. Um, I think we have time for okay. maybe one question. And then, so there are a few, a few questions in the chat, but I think maybe uh, we, we'll do one and then see where we are. Uh, so that we can start the second talk at the bottom of the hour. And then uh, if both speakers can stay a little bit uh, after yeah. both talks, we'll make sure that we get to every question if everyone can stay. So the first question in the chat is from Nancy Ford, uh, who is asking, um, when the yeast structures evolve to be entangled, is there a change in the organization or mechanics of the multicellular strands, for example, more flexible, more twisted, et cetera, that facilitates the entanglement? That's such a good question. Mm -hmm. We are working on that. So Tom is working on what, on sort of understanding what's required for entanglement. Um, and it looks, so, so, so it's still a work in progress. Um, I, I, they do, they do get more flexible. And actually we have some recent time-lapse videos, which actually shows the yeast cells grow, growing and then actually bending almost 90 degrees as they grow. So, so they certainly are becoming more flexible. And we don't know if that's due to changes in the cell wall or just, you know, a short spaghetti noodle is more rigid than a long spaghetti noodle, and these things are getting long. So it's just a, you know, that, that seems to be, if nothing else is happening, that's part of it. Um, and the basic, the basic topology of the branches is similar, um, but we are seeing more branching coming from the sides as well, because when you, when you take a, a yeast cell, which has sort of these, check, these landmarks for where they're going to make their next buds, and they tend to be on a pole. But if you take that pole, which would be on, you know, the almost one hemisphere, 
and you stretch it out. Now there's very little real estate to stick a new cell on the tip. And so you actually change the branching angle to be closer to 90 degrees. And that makes a smaller number of reproductions required to get loops. And that facilitates entanglement. So the combination of tip growth, steep branching, and softer cells all makes entanglement a pretty easy thing for these cells to achieve. I mean, I think entanglement in biology is fairly trivial compared to entanglement of granular materials where you have to shake them and they have to have very specific shapes um, because they can grow. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Let's, um, let's thank the speaker one more time. Cool. All right, thank you. Um, and so since it is 10.30, well, I'm speaking in, in central US time here, uh, since it's the bottom of the hour, uh, let's move on to our second talk, but we'll, um, I know there are some other questions for Will, so we'll circle back to those. Hopefully everyone else can stay. Um, 